This evening, as you open your Bibles with me to Luke 23, I'd like to invite you to listen to the gospel in 10 words from the altar of the cross. And what I'd like you to consider with me is that Good Friday is all about God the Father sacrificing his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on an altar. And he sacrificed him as the Lamb of God, slain for the sin of the world. The altar that God used was the cross of Christ's crucifixion. And as we watch and listen to Christ upon that cross, we get an amazing glimpse into the very heart of God. But above and beyond everything else, we could see if we'd been there or hear or understand as we read this account of the crucifixion. It is Jesus sharing the gospel. It's his very first 10 words that he shared from the cross that should thrill our hearts tonight. We gather tonight out of love, out of devotion, because of the one who suffered and bled and died for us 2,000 years ago. We come with joy, with reverence, to remember and worship him for what he did for us. And so we look down and through the pages of scripture in verse 34 of Luke 23, we see these 10 astounding words. Verse 34 says, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That really distills down Christ's purpose on the cross to reveal God as Savior. And this evening, and each time we enter the treasure house of the record in God's word, as we see Christ last week, as we look at this, Christ's final day, and then at his glorious resurrection, we're always astounded because each time it reveals more of the heart of our God. As we focus on the six hours of the crucifixion, as we see the vivid detail that the Lord brings to us in Scripture, just the fact that Jesus actually spoke from the cross in itself is an amazing thing. God's Word records each of the seven times he spoke, and these are seven messages And they are together an amazing explanation as Jesus Christ himself tells us from the cross what he's doing for us on the cross. But before we analyze any of those words, what is amazing is that Jesus speaks it all, knowing as we do the horrible pain of crucifixion. So before we look at what he said, Think of where he was. After Pilate washed his hands of the matter, Jesus was seized, and calloused Roman soldiers led him through the streets of Jerusalem. Of course, commemorated today in all the the events in Jerusalem, the Via Dolorosa, but taken near that same route out the Damascus Gate to a public place, a place of Roman execution. There beside a heavily traveled road that headed to Damascus and there with everyone watching, Jesus was crucified in full view of those in the city as well as all the travelers on that highway that went back and forth from Jerusalem to Damascus. And there, a death squad, the pros of Roman crucifixion, rudely stripped Christ harshly pushed him on an already bloodied and torn cross, used other times, but in that rough and filthy piece of wood, Jesus was held down by filthy iron spikes, salvaged most likely from previous executions. Those were pounded through his wrists, his ankles, and in that time, mankind was murdering their maker using carpenter's tools. After they finished their cruel piercings, Jesus Christ hung there to be seen by all. 
The soldiers wiped off their hands. They collected their tools. They gambled for their share of the condemned one's possessions. And then they took their stations, as they had so many times before, around the crosses to stand guard until death came to those three criminals. It was normal. It was customary. It was routine. But in the midst of all that, there's a stir. The prisoner in the middle, held by spikes, crowned by thorns, covered by bleeding wounds, is about to speak to his cruel tormentors. His lips began to move, and Jesus spoke from the cross. And we can call that message Christ's seven words from the altar of the cross. Now, he actually spoke 50, and he spoke seven times, and there are only 39 Greek words, but seven specific messages Jesus gave over the course of those six hours. And those are Christ explaining to us what he was doing on that cross. Crucifixion was so cruel, it was so painful and so completely debilitating to all the body's systems that any use of air for talking was done so at great cost. That's why God's word records for us what he said. Jesus gave seven precious messages from the altar of the cross. To the end, Jesus was God the Son. To the end, he was holding together the cosmos while he was being crushed under the wrath of his Father. Last words are often very precious. Loved ones gather near to hear them. But these words head the list. Perhaps they're the most amazing, astounding, and transforming words that Christ ever spoke. He spoke in pain. He spoke in short gasps. He spoke exactly seven times. And from the dying lips of Jesus, and from his raging, thirst-dried mouth, in the midst of excruciating pain, and even though he was being crushed by the horrors of sin and death and the pains of hell, Jesus carefully and clearly spoke to us and to them. If we will listen, Jesus is speaking to each of us today from his crucifixion. We can hear through Christ what we could call the heart of God revealed. The heart of God from Jesus on the cross was revealed through these seven messages. And if you take the life of Christ and put it in chronological order, you'll find that this is what he said. No gospel writer records all of them. No gospel writer puts anything other than their piece of the gospel record, but taken together, the seven are beautifully presented in Luke 23, Jesus spoke of forgiveness. Father, forgive them so we can know that we are forgiven. Again, Jesus spoke in verse 42 of assurance. Today, you'll be with me in paradise, he said to the thieves, so that we also can know that we have reservations in heaven. In John 19, Jesus spoke of compassion. As he said, woman, behold your son and gave Mary to John so that we can know that we're never alone. In Matthew 27, Jesus spoke of his substitutionary work when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we can always remember he took our place. Again, in John 19, Jesus spoke of his agony when he said, I thirst so that we can know that Jesus understands our weaknesses and our pains. Again in John 19, Jesus spoke triumphantly when he said, it is finished. So we can always remember that our salvation is secured and finished. But finally, back here in Luke, in 2346, Jesus spoke of security. When he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit so we can know that we are heaven bound so we could condense the whole message of the cross that Jesus gave down to these words he spoke of. Forgiveness, assurance, compassion, substitution, agony, triumph, and security. 
But before we examine any more of the events surrounding these words, we have to come to a moment of discovery. Something maybe we hasten by too rapidly and don't ponder. And what I call that is the silence of our patient God. Have you ever wondered about the silence of God in the face of incredible injustice here on earth? That troubles many people. Have you ever felt the horror of wickedness that goes unpunished in warfare or terrorism or poverty or starvation or genocide or cruelty at any level? And it seems like it just goes unchecked year after year. If you ever want to understand the silence of God in the midst of horrific sin, here at the cross it's explained. Or if you ever want to know why nothing happens when Muslims in Syria torture and lynch believers, when Hindus in India beat and burn alive missionaries, and when North Korean imprisons, starves, abuses Christians by the hundred, the answer to all injustices can be seen by what God does at the crucifixion of Christ. God is a God of love with an immense amount of patience. And we can most clearly see this attribute of God's immense patience when we look at the crucifixion for what it really was. It was the worst sin ever committed. At the crucifixion, we can safely conclude that there could never be a greater amount of blasphemy that was ever heaped upon God than here at Golgotha. That comes when we think of, of what was really going on. God the Son, the very creator, walking upon earth, was taken, horribly treated, beaten, spit upon, hated with every word, look, and act that sinful mankind could think of, and they hurled it at him. And on the cross, Jesus hung there, the target of humanity's hatred and blasphemy. Most of the characters that came and went from the cross were as sarcastic and abusive, demeaning and hateful as their dark hearts could conjure up. They gave him every evil they could think of. They sneered at God. They mocked his deity. They scorned the true and living creator. And they blasphemed the Redeemer and King. Nothing we could think of could ever come near this level of blasphemy toward the very God of the universe as he hung there in human flesh. There is nothing more that sinners could ever do to top this direct face-to-face -face hatred, mockery, blasphemy, rebellion, and scorn. And as I read it this week, like many of you, we all just are waiting for God to act. The Lord Jesus Christ hangs there. He was humiliated. He was stripped of his clothing. He was scourged. He was falsely worshipped, cursed, covered with blood and spit, hated as much as hatred as words and expressions and actions can convey. And if there was ever a moment in history that demanded God act, it would be now. This is the pinnacle of sin. This is the darkest moment of evil. This is the greatest outpouring of wickedness imaginable and the most direct blasphemy of the holy and almighty God possible. But pause and think about what we all know. All that evil was spewed at the holy, infinitely powerful God of the universe and nothing happens. That's the mystery. Nothing visibly happens. Venom, bile, hatred, rebellion, blasphemy, they just all keep flowing from these characters until they slowly tire of the spectacle and drift away. Until it's just some soldiers and a few others that are left to watch through the rest of the daylight to noon, through the three hours of darkness, and then back to the daylight finale. No God ever imagined by world religions would ever be portrayed this way. 
No demon idol god of paganism would ever be treated this way. Yet, Almighty God took it all. The crucifixion would have been the ultimate moment to establish himself as king of the universe. Now think, if Hollywood could take this and redo it, how they would do it. Think of Jesus Christ in blazing fire, with consuming wrath, melting away those spikes, shattering the wood of the cross, rising up until he towered over the scene, and as he gazed at those hateful people, slowly incinerating them. That's the way we would write it. If this is the Son of God, the one that could silence the raging sea of Galilee, certainly he could have flattened that city, subdued all the nations, and ended the rebellion once and for all by force. He can, he will, but he doesn't do it now here at Calvary. He waits, endures, bears, suffers, sorrows, and finally he dies. And the horrific judgment he foresaw just earlier in the week on Palm Sunday as he wept over the city won't be poured out until 40 years later. Perhaps even some of those who mocked him at the cross would still be alive and those mockers would feel a tiny taste of the wrath of God. But by every reckoning, what we see here at the crucifixion is strange justice. And what I mean by that is, it is strange justice that made the outpouring of the wrath of God to be directed toward the one on the cross and not upon the crowd of blasphemers at his feet. God's punishment for blasphemers is crystal clear. In Leviticus 24 it says, whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall be put to death. And the blasphemers of the name of the Lord shall be put to death twice in one verse. God said, I don't tolerate blasphemy. Jesus already warned him repeatedly through his trials of the danger of blaspheming the, the God of the universe. In fact, at one of his trials, he said, in effect, watch out. Do you realize who you're talking to? And he said that in Mark 14 when he kept silent through all their blasphemies, and finally they said, say something. And Jesus said in Mark 14, 62, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. From our perspectives, as humans, this is twisted, perverted justice that God's wrath falls on the one blasphemed and not on the blasphemers. That the curse of sin crushes the sinless one, not the sin-filled ones. And that the holy God has every right to catapult all of us into hell. Instead, he pours out the cup of his wrath to the very last dreg on his beloved son. That's what we celebrate on Good Friday. The strange justice of God. The struggle we have with God's patience for sinners is reflected from cover to cover in the Bible. The prophet Habakkuk, when he saw the evil within and around Israel, begged God for justice and said this, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save? That's the mystery of God's patience. All the way through God's word to the very end, the same question and the same mystery of God's patience with such sinful humanity echoes in the words of the martyrs gathered at the feet of God Almighty. In Revelation 6.10, it says this, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Well, today, we join with the saints of all generations in amazement at the patience of our all-powerful God and his Son, Jesus Christ. If any moment ever deserved the zap of a blinding stroke of the furious, wrath-filled judgment of God, those scorners at Christ's feet 
as he hung there dripping with blood and spit, deserved to be struck. How amazing instead it is when we hear him speak. As God's wrath is heaped upon Christ, as Christ's life is being crushed and drained out of him as his blood flows, he speaks. And most strange, of all that he says is that first utterance, Christ's first message from the cross was a cry to God for mercy on his tormentors. The gospel in ten words from the altar of the cross was the first of the seven. And if you look down at your Bibles to prepare for communion, think of what verse 34 says. Luke notes it was during or soon after the cross was raised along the road just outside the Damascus Gate There in Jerusalem at a place called Golgotha, as the executioners began to gamble for the clothes of Jesus, Christ was asking God for their forgiveness. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, verse 33 says, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then verse 34 Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Jesus speaks to each one of us tonight from his crucifixion. And tonight, he invites us to offer our thanks to God for loving us so much that he sent his son to suffer the wrath that just like that crowd deserved, each one of us deserved. Let's bow for a word of prayer. As you bow, I invite the elders and deacons to prepare to serve us. And as they go, far more important than their preparation with the physical elements is our preparation of our hearts. With heads bowed and eyes closed before the Lord, think of what Jesus suffered for you as I think of what he suffered for me. God made him who knew no sin to become my sin so that I could come tonight and partake of this table with no fear of the wrath of God. And that's why at this service we focus upon Christ who became sin for us and died in our place. And Father, we ask that we would partake of this bread and of this cup with clean hands. And even in this moment, touch, move, convict, stir our hearts if there is any sin that is covered in our lives, if there is any sin that is unforsaken and is staring your spirit's fullness and grieving and quenching him from filling us this night, may we confess and forsake that because though you have already forgiven us, you have told us we're responsible to keep confessing forsaking so that you can keep cleansing us from all unrighteousness. May we with clean hands and pure hearts partake tonight. And may from this little spot on this world that you created, there rise a fragrant cloud of the worship of your saints. And may we join all of those believers around the world who have offered a sacrifice of adoration to you as we remember your body becoming sin for us and your blood poured out to cleanse us forever of our sins. We bless your name. 
with thanksgiving, O Christ. We pray you be glorified. And all God's people said, Amen.